the expressions of this change, but I look all the way back at the beginning of the story, right? And it's communion. It's walking in the cool of the day in the garden mm -hmm. with God. And, and that communion, I think the, the specifications of worship will change. The expressions of worship mm -hmm. will change. But the thing that stays is we honor God. We honor and host his presence. Um, he is after our heart and not a form, but not a function. He wants communion with his people. Hi, welcome to the Cultural Catalyst, where we help you to learn how to live fully alive, co-labor with God, and change the world. My name's Chris Valentin, and today I have Kelly. And Kelly, I am not going to try to pronounce your last name, <laughs> so you go for it. That's wisdom. As far as I know, it's Heiligenthal. Kelly Heiligenthal. Yeah, I think it's got a <laughs> on it, Yeah, though. I think you're right. I definitely missed that part. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask... Next time I say it, I'll check in with you and make sure I'm I'm doing it right. <laughs> you were with us for a long time. You were you were on staff for like eight years, right? Yeah, yeah, eight years. Which I think Bethel years that might translate different. So much happens in so much time. You know, it's kind of like like dog years or something. I feel like it must have been decades, yeah. a wonderful decades that <laughs> I was there. <laughs> and you were you were a revival group pastor for two years. We yeah. finally ripped you out of that. <laughs> <laughs> and put you into you are our worship leader for five years uh, at at uh, NBSSM teaching yeah. and training those guys, yeah. and uh, I kill you know I didn't know this part about you till they gave me this thing you you actually have a degree where is it you have a theological degree yeah in biblical studies I do I do wow. yeah uh, four year liberal arts degree in Bible and theology. And then the other, like the other really random bonus is I am a 30 page paper short of a Spanish degree major. So I have a, a minor, but I just decided to not do a 30 page paper on the politics of Colombia in Spanish. Um, I don't know if I regret doing that or not. <laughs> that, you, I think that might have been wisdom to you actually take a minor. are close to a degree in Spanish. I'm one class away. And yeah. what? And you were going. You're going to do a 30 page paper on white paper on what? The what? The politics of Colombia. That what? was the requirement, and I said thank you, but no thank you. <laughs> I'll take the minor, um, and I'll take the the major in Bible and theology. So, wow. do, yeah, little known facts. <laughs> do you keep your Spanish alive? I didn't know no. this about you. I, you know what? It's because I, I have a little, I have a little side of shame on it because you know how they say like, go get your college degree. It's yeah. always relevant. It'll always mean something wherever you go. I, I found the one major where that's not true, Chris, and it's in a foreign language that you don't keep up. Um, I go to Chipotle and I feel shame. I'm like, I, I don't Chipotle. dare say guacamole because it might be wrong. You know, I've lost my, I've lost the edge. That's like going to Taco Bell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, well, I went to What's the Matter You, so you can imagine what my degree is doing for me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe more than my Spanish is doing for me. So Man, You know what? We have a Spanish school, an uh, online Spanish school now, and we got I heard that. That's a couple incredible. hundred students in it. And you know what? Oh, we have an online Portuguese school. You'll love this. We had 3,600 students sign up for more information. And, you know, they're all, you know how this goes, they interview, right? They interview them. So it's like, where are we going to interview 3,600 students? And we have to find enough, you know, interviewers that can speak Portuguese to interview the students. So it's like, oh, my gosh, we had no idea. So our Portuguese our Portuguese school is the fastest growing school we have. I mean, could easily. The hunger. I know. It's crazy. Unbelievable. 
And that's uh, that's our dear Paula Romez, who she, I'm mispronouncing that last name as well, and I know that. But she, uh, she, we've known her, man. We love Paula. She interned for me way, way back. Oh, she did. And um, I remember even then. I mean, she's just had such a heart. She's had such a heart for her people, her nation, and watching this all unfold. When I heard, oh my goodness, they're doing it. I'm like, it is. This is going to be a wildfire. I mean, truly, it's it is incredible to watch what's it, happening in your online schools. I mean, it's amazing, Chris. Yeah, I mean, honestly, in the last two years, we've had two dead raisings, and they both came from online school. And I, you know, oh. I don't know if we had two dead raisings in 10 years on the on-campus school, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. But we, but twice it happened uh, online. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Oh, amazing. Hey, uh, okay. We have some questions for you. Take us on a journey and how you encounter Jesus and ultimately transition to the role of worship leader. I I actually don't know this about you because I didn't do the initial interview years ago. Yeah. You are a Christian, right? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Thank Absolutely. Sure. Check, check, check. Yep. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm a pastor's kid, grew up loving the Lord. Uh, I grew up doing like, do you remember with worship before it was like lyrics on the screen and, and how fancy it is? It was like the projector, the transparency. <laughs> you put it on and then you're like, oh no, it's upside down. <laughs> oh no. And you do about 12 different versions. So I was like, I did that. But um, always like loved, loved worship. Uh, I was the PowerPoint girl once we got technologically advanced in that way and but always kind of was insecure about it and liked to kind of play more in the background. Um, oh, that was really in the forefront having to put those slides up was you deal with pressure that way. That's how you that's how you like, you know, trial by fire because everybody sees the failure. It's plain, you know. Sometimes leading worship, you can, you know, you can cover some things up, but transparencies, there's no way around that, you know. Yeah. Or yeah. you don't t you don't put the right one up there, you put it up too slow, all of that stuff. All of it. Yeah. All of it. That's a real training ground. That's I think that's a forgotten art there. So, yeah, I, I did the transparencies, the lyrics, all that and um you know, I think some people get so nervous. I remember I, I really was this way too, where it's like, oh, what's the calling of God on my life? And and what if I miss it? Like, what if we miss it? And I'm telling you, I, I feel like my heart's always been really soft to the Lord. I love Jesus. I was raised to love Jesus. And, and I've really always had a, a, a soft heart and a close ear, I think, to his voice. Um, but I, um, I really like worship leading wasn't the goal. It wasn't the dream. I know for so many people, that's like the dream, the goal. Um, for me, I really had so much insecurity for so long that I was happy to be, you know, doing the lyrics. I was happy to, and those are amazing, but some of it was probably hiding for me where I just, I, I've, I've feared not being good enough or failure. And, um, but I just don't think that the call of God is that fragile. I don't think it's that, Weak. I don't. I think it really chases you down and tackles you with with a soft heart toward the Lord and a, an ear leaned into Him. I I don't think it's that easy to dodge the calling of God in your life. And so, I feel like you know, Chris. I I know for a lot of people, beautifully, it's something they steward, they put out in front of them, they take steps and then walk it out. I think for me, it it was a lot of yeses from the Lord of um. Kind of very kind of shaky yeses, like are you sure? Kind of yeses, um, and and walking into things that um, you know, kind of feeble um, and a little a little weak and insecure. But the Lord's been so amazing to to really get me. I think where uh, where His heart has been for me, and so that's really my journey. That's my story, and it hasn't been one where it's like you know you bust the door open and. And then all that, it's really been kind of, you know, fear and trembling along the way. But man, he is, he has just been faithful. These little yeses really get you somewhere, sincerely, you know? Well, they haven't got me anywhere in the worship world. It's still coming. I've been doing the yeses coming. for a long time, 26 years at Bethel, even started the worship school. And, and I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to lead some worship here. And they're like, uh, no, no, you're not. <laughs> so no, you're not, you know maybe it's not the end suddenly breakthrough you know maybe maybe it's one of those those long the long burns you, you know? got to keep pushing in maybe that's possible <laughs> yeah. yep just around the corner it's coming what would you say is god's design for worship like does god have a design for worship 
I don't even you actually know, know if I, mean, I like that question. Like, I'm not sure what it means, but say, say what you think it means. <laughs> well, you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Okay, I didn't um, write the question. I'm like, God's design for worship. What's it look like? <laughs> like, like I, I know it didn't include drums when I was first saved. They're like, drums are from the devil. So I'm like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God's design for worship are transparency. So let's go back. Let's <laughs> yes, get back. No. Exactly. Um, I think, you know what, I, I think that's what's so beautiful is we really do see the the forms of worship have changed alongside culture, alongside, you know, music and expression. And it's like, um, you know, I, th- I think the specifications or the the container that our, that our worship takes, it it changes, right? Yeah, I th- even think like through the Old Testament and the New Testament, was, there's a temple and you have the Lord giving specific measurements that he was looking for, for his glory to dwell in cubits, right? Like exactly. he wants these specific measurements for his glory to be. There's the Ark of the Covenant. There's the, the you know, the tabernacle. And then all of a sudden we see that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and and worship. It's like... The, the are you trying to say he cares about our measurements? Because I, I'm, because <laughs> I will say yeah. I've been I've been expanding the temple quite well over the <laughs> last twenty five years. Sorry, I couldn't I couldn't so resist. Good. It was just that's so just good. Me. That's so good. And you started talking yeah, about yeah. measurements of the temple, and I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know. Wait if that, a second. Does that We're translate into the New Testament here. temple? Because I've I'm like I'm sp- I'm spreading out to your left and right. There it is, <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah fifty four. Lengthen your cords. I'm like, yeah, no one seems to like it when you, sorry, (laughs) I interrupted a very important point you were making. No, (laughs) no, no. Listen, that's it. Um, But I think, I mean, so the way that the container right now, the Holy Spirit lives inside us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Our worship, we don't, we don't do worship. It's something we engage in, but, but we are honoring Jesus Christ's hope of glory on the inside of us. We are we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And so the expressions of this change, but I look all the way back at the beginning of the story, right? And it's communion. It's walking in the cool of the day in the garden mm-hmm. with God. And, and that communion, I think the, the specifications of worship will change. The expressions of worship mm-hmm. will change. But the thing that stays is we honor God. We honor and host his presence. Um, he is after our heart and not a form, but not a function. He wants communion with his people. And we see back in the garden all the way through this restoration story of I must be close to my people, right? And then you have the the whole of the Old Testament. And then what in John 1, it's the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. You see this God with us, Emmanuel. And so worship, I think, is is learning how to host his presence, how to maintain nearness. That happens in song, right? But it's so much more than that. That's, you know, I think where we say worship is a lifestyle, it really, it really is. I don't know. Is that a proper uh, answer? That was, was a, that's a big question. And, and your, your, you know, theological degree was just popping out everywhere right there. <laughs> Not Spanish yet. Not that Spanish one's not going to pop up. Almost stas. Yeah, I don't know. That's yeah. all I know, by the way. Don't answer that question. No. You, you, <laughs> you know, do you think the role, I don't want to set you up the wrong way, but how do you describe the role of worship? It, you know, what role does worship play in tough seasons? Yeah. You ever had a tough season? I, I had have. a tough season one time. Yeah. Started Once, when I came out that. of the womb, and it's 69 years later, it's still there. <laughs> well, we're still in it. Yeah, still in it. Yeah, you know, I think, um, I think, I think a real big kind of test of, of of our worship. The point isn't that we're tested, right? But, but I think the true nature of what we believe about God, the true nature of of who we are, um, tragedy is a great exposer right? Like pain, difficult seasons is the great exposer. And so um, when, you know, when we're on a mountaintop, when things are easy, when we see things going our way, worship is, is pretty easy to engage with as well, right? I I think, um, you know, I, I think about like, what is it Hebrews where it's without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, the faith that's required when we don't see the sun shining in front of us. When, in yeah. fact, all I see is the valley of the shadow of death on my right, on my left, forward, and behind me. 
when when that's the reality, then then my faith, right, my ability to please God um, is is all around me as well. You know, and I, I think the heart of a worshiper is, God, I want to bring you pleasure. I want to move your heart. I want to bring you joy. And I and I think sometimes in these moments where it's the most costly, um, we get to bring him something so valuable where regardless of my context or what I'm looking at, what I'm facing, who he is has not changed. So, so my worship, I'm not going to be in denial, right? Like I'm not going to say, and I think that's the spirit yeah. and truth kind of worship that we hear where it's like, it's not like I'm sitting here in denial saying everything's good. All I see is sunshine. No, this, this is a, this is intense, right? Yeah. The, the trueness of that, but the spirit of you are who you say you are, regardless of my circumstance, regardless of what I'm surrounded by, my worship will remain the same. My context will change. I'll be honest with the Lord in it. But in spirit and in truth, I'm acknowledging you are faithful. You are Alpha and Omega. You go ahead and behind and everything in between. Your name is a mighty tower and I will run to it and find my salvation. And while I wait for the salvation of the Lord, he will have my praise, right? And so I think it is our ability to make good on some of these. Have you ever been in worship where you're like, I just, oh God, I, I'm I'm feeling it. You can, you can have everything. I wanna bring an extravagant gift I've never done before, but I can't do more cartwheels and I can't jump higher in the moment. And I wanna bring you something. I think the place we bring something is, is in these difficult situations and these circumstances yeah. where it's the last thing I'm feeling the the song and dance is not around me. I feel alone. I feel darkness. Um, but he is unchanging, and and that's where I will worship from. My worship can stay the same through all of it. So I I do think it's a gift to kind of worship as as hard as and I wouldn't say it's easy, right? But uh, but there's a gift to be found in those seasons as we pray, is you know. Yeah, I do. I think that. It addresses something that's probably so real in all of us. When you know, when we we have our hands raised, and you know, let's say we're in corporate worship, and there's there's momentum with the crowd. Yeah. And you have your your hands raised, and you're singing the same song, but you feel nothing. And yes. you say to yourself, "I bet you everybody who's ever worshipped has had these moments where you're like, am I just doing what everybody else is doing? Because I feel nothing." Right. Yes. And, and, you know, what you just said is actually profoundly powerful because the truth is, is that worship isn't for me, it's for him. Yeah. Worship isn't about how I feel, it's about how he feels, right? Yes. And yes. then, you know, I love what David said when he said, far be it from me that I should offer to God something that costs me nothing. So I love what you said because I think the truth is, is that I, I often wonder if the acceptable, the, my acceptable sacrifice is... See, I'm trying to find words. Maybe it's more profound to God when it's a sacrifice, meaning I ain't feeling anything. Yeah. And I think that you're touching on that, that there's just a lot of people that feel like they're faking it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to fake it till I make it. It's like if I'm sacrificing onto God and I'm not feeling anything, but I do it, I continue to offer up thanksgiving my i offer up praise even though i'm feeling nothing i often think that that's way more profound well we both know this because you know you've been married for a while i've been married a couple of weeks longer than you yes. and i and i and i say in marriage you know a great marriage is do what you do when you feel like it when you don't yes like yes. what how do you how do you have a good marriage well there's way more than one line, but do what you do when you feel like it, when you don't, because yeah. when you're feeling it and you're like, can I, you know, how can I help? Can I get something for you? What, you know, and then, you know, the feeling goes away and you still behave as you did when you felt like it. That's the root. That's one of the core wow. roots of a great marriage, right? Wow. It's a, it's that's one of incredible. the core roots of loving God too. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Hey, that's let's incredible. change subjects a little bit. Same yeah. in worship, but let's change a little subject. Tell, uh, how do you actually write? Like, how, how do you, like I, I'm a I'm a I'm a writer, as you know. I'm yes. a I write books. I'm an author. Yeah. 
Like, do you just, are you just walking around like singing, uh, sh, you know, sh, El Shaddai and all of a sudden like, oh, I got a new song. Like, like how specifically, how, how do you actually get to a song? Because you've written a lot of songs, great songs, mm-hmm. probably some not great songs if you're anything like me. I, I don't know the ones that are not great because I, I only hear the great ones, but I've written a lot of things that aren't, aren't great. So I just assume that happens too. But how, how do you write? A great song like what what is your like what is your process yeah i remember the first song i ever wrote i was in college it's much like leading worship i think mm. i've just been so afraid to to embark on something that i didn't have full assurance i would be the best the earth has ever seen um <laughs> the yeah. first go at it so then i just don't you know so songwriting if i had been before like oh i don't want to lead worship i don't want to sing um it would have been like absolutely never will i write a song i mean that that was like a that was like a hard no for me and so it is pretty miraculous honestly that i uh that i'm here uh, to to be really honest like so the first song i wrote i was in college and i remember i got up the nerve to be like maybe i can do this i think i care about it i think i want to and i'll never forget i showed some friends and um (laughs) i was i was I, I'm gonna start sweating. It's like I was. I'm there. You're gonna again. relive the moment. Horrible. So I'm like, I have this like this tender little baby of a song, and you know, I'm a deep feeler. Um, I have a you lot are. of emotions, and I'm gonna fit every last one in this song. So I go. There's like it's in my dorm room, and I have a bunch of my friends, and they're gathered, and I'm like, hey, can I show you guys something? And like eight minutes later, when I'm done pouring my heart out, it's <laughs> It is really intense. There's just silence, crickets in the room. And uh, one guy, brave enough, speaks out and he was like, that was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, sister, don't quit your day job. (laughs) Fully. Fully. There's there's no chance that Amy Grant's in any danger of you uh, competing with her at this point. Everyone's fine. Everyone's fine. Carry on. So um, I, at that point, I decided I'll never, I, I won't do that again. That was, that's enough. I'll take a hint. Um, <laughs> and so honestly, like pretty reluctant songwriter. Um, but again, when the Lord has something over your life, he'll, he'll get you there, right? And so I think the process of songwriting for me was like really painful, really like, uh because I, I I feel like I'm more of a writer than I am a songwriter. And by that, I mean, if I can sit down and just any free form express the way that I'd like to, whether that has a rhyme or not, if it's like more of a message or whatever, I love that. I, I find myself in that. It's really comfortable for me. Writing like a song that has to be approachable for people to sing has to be theologically right and creative has to fit in this amount of syllables um i remember people being like this is so therapeutic it's it's um it's like therapy when i write and i was like that i mean that's amazing i have to go to therapy because i'm (laughs) trying to write it was so frustrating for me chris and so for really honestly for years and years i only continued i only um i only kept writing because the lord I'd, I'd tell the Lord, I'm, I'm going to quit. This is the time when I quit. And he'd say, oh, this is the line where your obedience stops, huh? <laughs> like, sir, no, sir. So I honestly, it was years of like just giving it a try and not being very good at it. And then getting some success and feeling like an imposter. And um, so my process now, honestly, it it was a lot of like, how do I find what I what I really believe about God um, and and what would actually move a congregation to be with me in that journey. Um, so good. Because I think if I'm just writing songs to process for myself, those are have a lot less that you need to think about, right? But if you're lead, if you're writing a song to lead people somewhere, there's a whole lot more you have to think about, right? And so Holy. I think a lot of my process has been like, being willing to be wrong, being willing to, you know, adjust and work and learn from other people and keep going when the Lord says, no, 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 you're not done yet. And so um, I find more ease to it now, but it really has been a journey for me, for sure. What's your uh, What's your most popular song? 
that you've written? Uh, the first one I ever finished was Everbee, and that is the most popular one. So, um, yeah. That was, and that's that's and kind honestly, of strange, right? Your first song. It's so strange. Is the most popular one. My first book's my most popular book, too. It's kind of kind of. Isn't strange. that bizarre? You yeah. just wrote a song. I haven't heard it. So this is on the questions, and now i got to go listen to the song. Not even uh -huh. one. What's the message? I, I don't even know what the song's about. So, and they they're they're asking like, what were you hoping to convey with that song? Mm. Uh, it was about my almost degree in Spanish. Just kidding. <laughs> it was not that. Um, <laughs> not even one more paper. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> no. It uh, so yeah, it was written with a friend of mine, Bo Maddox. From he was actually in the School of Ministry at Bethel for a while, and now he's at Upper Room. And so we we just wrote this song. He he brought this really beautiful you know chorus that he'd been singing at Upper Room, and um and we just kind of finish the song out together and sometimes you write songs and you so um and you kind of trust them to just see where they go and then sometimes there's other songs that really stick with you and kind of strike a chord and that was one of those for me where it just felt like um the message of it is it's not even one comes close not even one compares to you very high praise and this kind of came at a time um so we lost our little girl four years ago now wow. and writing before that versus after it really it really changed pretty significantly everything changed right yeah, sure. but um this song this song was one where i just felt so much resonance with it because i want to sing the songs that she's surrounded by yeah. um, i want to sing the eternal songs Ooh, that. that are at the base of the throne of God. Like, I want to find Girl, what... I didn't bring any Kleenex. You're going to have to stop. I, I was with you in that battle. Oh, I know. I, I know. I was in the hospital in that battle. I know. I know. I know. Yeah. And we're so grateful. We're yeah, so grateful. No, I just mean, you know, tears. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it really, like, that little girl continues to shape. I, I guess I'm like, there are songs beautifully that get us through, like we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. the, the valleys, the the circumstances that are hard, that we need these songs. You see in the Psalms where it's these honest, earthly process Psalms that strengthen the soul to continue, right? And yeah. those, there's such a place for that. They're so important. Um, and I'm grateful for those, and I like writing those. I think um, the really precious ones to me are the ones that tap into that sound, the sound of where we're headed, the sound once every, you know, once every valley is brought up high and every mountain is made low and it's a level path of pasture. When 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 we finally arrive, what are we saying then? We're saying, holy, holy, worthy, is the lamb of god right mm -hmm. i want to echo those songs here they feel like an inheritance that she is getting a taste of before i do um yes. and so that song feels really precious to, it feels like a family song because she's there singing holy holy and and i want to sing the same thing here and do so you, it's i, I feel like they're just attempts at singing? catching it uh or, yeah like, uh, imaginations or visions of all of singing around the throne yeah i do uh That's early on the lord the lord said um she she has favorite songs um some of them callie are yours and she makes sure that the angels sing them <laughs> <laughs> that's what two-year-olds would do in heaven is like do it again all yeah, my love exactly. ever be do it again do mom songs so um but yeah i do i i, I think that's the uh that's beautiful that's the family line. That's the that's the the family song. The that's what we do. We worship. Legacy on both sides of the veil, baby. Yeah. That's yeah. beautiful. Okay, last question. This podcast is called Cultural Catalysts. And so yeah. from your perspective, what does it mean to be a catalyst to culture? Like how mm -hmm. do you feel like you're affecting culture? Well, Maybe I should ask, do you think you are? I mean, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that there's probably other times in my life where it felt a little bit more, you know, um, what is impact? You know what I'm saying? Is impact yeah, followers? Exactly. Is it numbers? Is it streams? Because I, I think that's that's one angle, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I, I look at Jesus. Yeah, I look at Jesus um, 
hanging on a cross no one could watch like he's he's on a roman torture device Mm -hmm. and and people have left the disciples they fell asleep while they were waiting it's this is painful they all lost it looks like every they they laid down their fisherman nets they gave up everything and and we just lost because he's he's there dead hanging but you have heaven watching and all the access of all of eternity is happening in this moment, right? Um, that is that is a cultural, that is the ultimate cultural catalyst. And it looked so counter what we would ever consider valuable or significant, or, and I know that's not, that's not what you're saying at all. It's, it's what I, I struggle to remember where it's, there's all these metrics, but what's the metric of heaven? What's the metric mm. of eternity? What matters there? And, uh, if it's hiddenness, then hide me, God. If it's being misunderstood, then then I will be found and understood by the eyes of my Father. Right? If it if it's like I want to sing songs that that all of heaven is singing, but maybe no one hears here, and that's how we change things. Then then I'll bring my part. And God, if you want to put a microphone to that, if you want to make that known and visible somewhere else i think all we can do is be obedient all we can do is bring our whole heart before the lord love his people love him and where that goes and how it spreads we entrust to him and so i don't know i don't know what mine looks like (laughs) right now to be honest um but but i hope that before the lord before heaven before before my kids um that I'm a, I'm a catalyst there, you know? I don't know, does that, does that answer or address right. it at all? Actually, best answer yet. Oh. The profound sense that being a cultural catalyst doesn't necessarily mean that anyone sees me. And yet, I'm affecting the course of history because of how I affect him. Yeah. That's a profound yeah. thought. And uh, That's what I want. ultimately, he's the one who's shifting. He's the one who directs culture, right? He's the one who directs nations. Yes. And so when I affect him, or I attract him, or I draw him, I am, whether anyone knows it or not, I am, I am affecting culture. I'm affecting history. Yes. And I think that's yeah. you know such a different take because it's a it's a third heaven take. It's a mm-hmm. it's not a like yeah here's my strategy because you know I'm you know me you've been work with me a long time I'm a strategy guy so it's like yeah hey how are we gonna touch our city like what's the plan and uh, but this is another way this is another reality another truth another way of looking mm-hmm. at it that I'm touching the Father whenever I do that I'm. Whenever I track the Father, whenever I track His attention, um, whenever I pray, whenever I prophesy, like I am affecting and infecting history. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Oh, the way you just put that, I'm, I'm really moved. I'm like, oh God, would you do that? Like the fact that mm-hmm. Gideon is hiding in a, a wine press, mm-hmm. and he says, my my warrior, mm-hmm. I've found you, and yeah. affects culture. And the man's hiding away. You know, Sorry. he can still come find us. He can still mm-hmm. come call us out. He can still, I, I mean, I feel like, I feel like the Bible is story after story of unlikely cultural catalysts, where it, what it took <laughs> was the hand of God pointing out, choosing, and, and unfolding the story. Why? Because he lo- culture is people, mm-hmm. and he loves people, and he wants to use people to love and serve people right and so the way that man the way that you just said that affecting god affects the world um i'm so moved by that chris it's totally true i didn't think of it till after you said that actually you're the one who's saying that Mm -hmm. Uh, i miss you guys so much i love you a lot i miss you a lot i think about you often Mm. i uh I remember you all the time, and I uh, carry you in my heart, which I, I tell you about every six months. It means the world. And uh, if ever you world. want to come home, the robe, <laughs> the ring, and the sandals will be here, and the fattened pastor 
will be here to with open arms. The Cubans, to, the measurements. Exactly. <laughs> He's expanding the, the temple so that we could have greater expansion of capacity for worship. Amen. Hey. Oh, Chris, we love you so much. Well, our family is different because of your yes. Thank I you. mean, again, that's like your yes, you're leaning into the, the voice of the Lord. You're following this, the beautiful strategy that you just, you walk with such ease in. Um, I'm, I'm one of thousands and the tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands who are impacted by your yes, your affection to the Lord, you're leaning into his voice. Um, and not not only us, but but our lineage, our legacy. And we just are so grateful for you, forever grateful for you. I love you. Let's stay connected. Let's talk offline yes. soon. Yes. I'd love, love to that. hear where you're heading. Absolutely, me too. <laughs> and hi to your husband and your kids yeah. and uh, and the team there. And uh, I, I'm, I'll, I'm going to talk to you soon. I love you so much. Love you too. Thank you so much. See you later. Bye.